The other, one of the other early things that I noticed was there are a lot of cans labeled Hortense Beverage, no title, Hortense Beverage, unidentified, and here's one of them. Um, sometimes there were lab uh, records. And one can in particular held a large quantity of little trims, five feet, or a few feet long. I thought I'd show a couple of these. This is um, Paul Robeson, and so I was really curious, particularly about this can of trims as to what they were. Um, Paul Robeson seemed like an important person, and I was unclear as to why these were in a can labeled Hortense Beverage. Here he is, as we were to learn, at uh, American Liberal Party <coughs> Christmas party. I guess he's Santa. For a long time I called this clip uh, Santa Paul Robeson. Um, another of, the, of these trims is, uh, here's playwright Alex, Alice Childress speaking on a stage. There's Robeson again, um, as well as several people, uh, Alphys Hunton, Louise Thompson Patterson is also seen in this footage. Um, these are these are all left-wing African American activists from Harlem in the 1940s and 1950s, and uh, these were little strips of film, and uh, we didn't know what they were. But somehow they're associated with Hortense Beveridge. So a cursory look uh, on the internet as to who Hortense Beveridge was revealed not very much at IMDb. She was actually listed as the editor of several making of featurette documentaries. These were mainly like eight to 12 minute um, making of documentaries, but for films like Bullet, Mean Streets, The Outlaw, Josie Wales, that uh, Coppola movie about in Ireland, I can't remember what it's called. Um, yes, Vinny and Gringo, thank you. Um, so the, the kind of, who is this person? Who is this Hortense Beveridge person? Her name also turned up when uh, Liz Coffey and the Harvard Film Archive along with um, John Claxman at Anthology were announcing the new digitization of uh, one of Amiri Baraka's films, Hortense Beveridge was the editor of that. And so this, this story just got very curious for me. Um, as I was to learn Hortense Beveridge, here she is, at the 1949 International Union of Students Congress in Bulgaria. I uh, was born in 1923. She was born to the, she was the daughter of um, uh, Rachel C., who moved north during the Great Migration to New York City from Virginia, and uh, Thorga C., who's a Liberian-born uh, scholar, and she was born in New York City, and through research, collective research, and ProQuest research, uh, we discovered at some point she is, becomes radicalized as a student. She goes to Hunter College. Um, she studies social work. And she becomes this student activist. She becomes very, very involved in the Communist Party and is the student delegate to many international communist student conferences um, in Europe and comes back and decides that she wants to make films. She gets help from an organization that was called, in 1949 she comes back to the United States and she she somehow finds, again, uh, not really sure about how all of this happens. The story of Hortense is like very fragmentary. Um, and in the book chapter, which this is supposed to be a teaser for, um, I had to come up with like an academic uh, argument. And so I made two of them. One of them is using uh, the concept of constellating women's film history that Jane Gaines uh, uses. Uh, invoking film prints because we're unable to learn about many of the professional um, credentials or experiences of women filmmakers. We're forced to constellate their position and it's a necessarily indeterminate process. Um, and so this seemed like a really good opportunity with this collection of films that were labeled Hortense Beveridge that I didn't know about that didn't have any credits that were often trims to do this. Um, T comes back to the United States. She becomes radicalized. She enrolls in an educational sponsorship program called the Committee for the Negro and the Arts, basically a mentorship program. Um, people like Harry Belafonte, Canada Lee, uh, lend their connections to help young African Americans interested in different artistic professions get jobs. One of these people is Leo Hurwitz, who is a leftist documentary from, filmmaker from the 1920s and 1930s, and T. Beveridge, as her nickname is T. Uh, Hortense T. Beveridge becomes very close to Leo Hurwitz. Uh, and his partner, Peggy Lawson, who's also a film editor. 
Um, he's given apprentice jobs, working with animation studios of blacklisted filmmakers who are making anonymous animation for commercial, for TV and commercials because they're unable to, to get proper work. Um, and in 1951, T is able to make her first, she's been able to edit her first film, which was in the collection, and it's called South I Africa Uncensored Year and Coca Cola. Well, such a city for white man is built for himself in South Africa. And this is what he has left to the Africans. What you just saw was an open... So South Africa Uncensored is about a 22-minute advocacy film, similar to kinds of films like, um, I think of the film that was at Orphan several years ago, Abra uh, with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, made by Henri cartier bresson These are short films that would have been um, made about a political cause and then shown at like a dinner party or like a party to, in order to raise money for a specific organization. And this film in particular, narrated by Paul Robeson, um, was made for the Council on African Affairs, which is one of the first United States-based anti-apartheid um, uh, organizations. And so T made this film. Um, I think she's about 20 at the time, and uh, this is the only known copy. The museum has preserved this film. It'll be available online later this year. Um, but the kind of story of who T was as this radical filmmaker got, got more interesting. <clears throat> what we learned about T was that in 1953 she was admitted to the Editors Union Local 771. She, as far as we can now tell from Local 771's uh, union archives, which are very excellent. Every time someone in the union got a job, it was documented on a, on a recipe card, and they still have those records. Um, that T became the first African American uh, woman film editor in New York City. And throughout the 1950s, she worked on commercial documentaries, uh, promotional industrial films for like, the Hamilton Watch Company, which they make swatches. Um, and by night, by that she would do that by day, she was very well paid, and by night, she would use her access to filmmaking in order to do, uh, make films for political causes. I want to end here with this really cool uh, shot that documents uh, this concept of films being shown at, uh, at labor organization meetings. So, thank you. You'll note that I'm not going to talk about another collection uh, that is held by the Smithsonian, uh, in part because, for reasons I'll talk about in the q and if you're interested. Um, so I wanted to start just with a, a review of some of the questions that I'm thinking about as I'm approaching these collections. Uh, so first, I'm interested in how these collections are acquired, when they're acquired, when they're discovered, what kind of assumptions are made about them. I think we have lots of frameworks uh, in scholarship and in archiving the idea of the orphan film, the idea of, again, the lost film, the fragment. So what does it mean to kind of attribute those categories to these films? Uh, likewise, uh, after a film is discovered and placed in an archive, what do scholars, community groups, even members of the general public, uh, what role do they play in placing the collect collection within existing context? So how do we see these collections? And then finally, uh, how is it possible, I think, to kind of change our understanding of these collections after they've been acquired, processed, made accessible. I think there's a way in which the kind of initial discovery of the collection locates it in a certain framework, and it's really hard to escape from that afterward. So I'll talk some about that. Um, so I wanted to start with the uh, Solomon Sir Jones collection. 
I'm also known as the Dr. S.S. Jones. One thing I learned in doing research is I almost never found a reference to him in uh, historical newspapers as Solomon Sir Jones. It was always S.S. Jones. And so that was a nice early discovery that allowed me to find lots of articles that I wouldn't have found otherwise. And so this collection, uh, for those who follow archiving news, uh, might have noticed uh, this item in the New York Times in 2009, kind of an interesting date, thinking of coming just a month after Barack Obama's inauguration as president. Uh, and this idea of, again, flickering images of black life back then, from the discovery of this film uh, collection in Oklahoma and its kind of placement um, in kind of acquisition, as we'll talk about later, it's already seen as a kind of lost collection that has immense value. Later, you see uh, C-SPAN ran a one hour, I think a 25 minute special on the collection uh, featuring Curry Ballard, who first acquired the collection in Oklahoma, then contacted an auction dealer in New York, then it was sold at auction to Yale University for $60,000. So kind of a very uh, deliberative kind of uh, pathway and interesting kind of way to think about how this collection gets uh, from wherever it was to uh, be made accessible. And I think if you look at the collection, and this is a, just one short clip, one thing that becomes very apparent uh, fairly early on in reading about it is both Jones himself was uh, a prominent person. He was not uh, just an itinerant filmmaker or just someone who was making home movies, but he was actually a very much a leader uh, in the African-American community in Oklahoma, founded several churches, uh, head <laughs> of the Boyd Division of the National Baptist, so a very prominent person kind of in his own right. And another thing that's also really fascinating to me that I think has been less commented on is these films are 1925. 1925 is very, very early for small gauge material. I'm fairly certain he was shooting with a film camera, not Kodak, because Kodak didn't have a spring-wound automatic camera yet. Uh, also, if you look at, say, Charles Tuckerman's Amateur Film Database, there is exactly one film from 1925 on it. So this is a film with titles. It's a professionally made film. So I think it counts as an amateur film, not a whole movie. And the fact that uh, this film exists and we're able to see it from this year is, is really important. Uh, also, I learned um, pretty quickly in doing research, uh, Jones was making films not because he just happened to pick up a camera, but because he won a contest. And so this is the Crisis Magazine, 1923. So you see on the left, uh, Madam Walker, a cosmetics company, the largest, I uh, think the largest uh, black-owned woman, black-owned business in the, in the U.S. And at this uh, point, they were very interested in increasing their kind of reputation uh, among the kind of uh, black elite, and so began sponsoring these contests uh, to travel to get a free trip to the Holy Land. And so it's you know, not too surprising that you know, Jones was positioned to win this contest. He actually won third place, um, receiving 2.5 million votes. I think he got 10 votes for each box he bought, so this is a major, major contest and you have advertisements all over the black press, both uh, black, local black newspapers as well as magazines in this period, and very much interested in publicizing this contest. And later, Jones uh, goes on tour with these films. So these were not just, again, films made you know, to be shot one place and then shown to people locally. He instead saw this as a tour. He was showing his films on the Holy Land uh, throughout the country. And to kind of return to kind of what Yale has done with these films, like they, this is a kind of a double-edged uh, thing. On the one hand, they put the films all online, which is really, really nice. Uh, they're all online, accessible. I even figured out a way to download them, which I'm not sure if that's intentional or not, but it's great. And they identified uh, each individual uh, scene in the film. Jones used title cards almost exclusively, so you can pick scene by scene and kind of locate what's, uh, what's there. One thing that's not done, though, is uh, any more than that. So these films are there, but not much context is provided. And the model I had in mind, the most, one of the most successful uh, events or instances in which the archives have been able to do more with the collection than just make it accessible, is the H.D. Waters collection, which is not only uh, used various mapping tools to kind of map the films, but also commissioned in 2015 a singer-songwriter and a filmmaker to kind of work with the film and produce a public performance that's now played at festivals and archives all over the, all over the world, or all over the country at least. And so that's kind of the model I had in mind to give what one could do with this Jones footage. And so I'll show here, this is, a, I had my undergraduate students go through the Jones films, they each had two to go through, 
uh, it, write in the locations, the date of the date the clip was produced, and then was able to geomap that. And so just get a sense of, you know, here's Joseph's travels to Europe and the Middle East. This is all early 1925, so again, very early. I think Jones might have been the first uh, American to shoot small gauge footage um, in Europe and the Middle East, and almost certainly the first African American. So again, very significant filmmaker, not just uh, in one context, but in a, in, a, in a larger context. Here's some more uh, images, and then in Oklahoma, all the towns we, where he visited. Um, to kind of switch gears a bit, uh, in a different kind of collection is uh, Reverend L. O. Taylor, a collection based in Memphis. And in this case, uh, the Taylor films are both lost and not lost. So one thing that you, you know, pretty early on figure out in looking at these films is that they've been known about for since the early 1980s. In 1989, Lynn Sachs, a documentarian and experimental filmmaker, made a documentary about the Jones films. And I'll show you just a brief clip here. He would take the picture and he would edit them together and make the presentation out of them. And he would show them in church. So when he had something like this, everybody went. And he'd have a house for it. And he had a mic. He would narrate as he went along. Because even though he was a minister, in my very nature, you know, minister, you don't, you know, it's photography and minister just. No, you don't have to mix it to it all, there's no reason to. But because of his love for photography, he didn't just take pictures, but he used his work as, as photography and filmmaking to make a social statement. It's a social statement what he did, because it was like a tale of two cities there. It's a really powerful and short film. Uh, this collection is still held by the Center of Southern Folklore. Here's their website, some information about the collection. Uh, in 2007, they received a $210,000 grant um, from the NEH to do some restoration work. And this is where the story gets interesting. So while the Jones collection, I feel, is very widely known, well known right now, uh, the Taylor films, even though they're from roughly the same era, I think with equal, equal significance, are not known at all, in part because after these films were preserved, they were placed on this uh, footage archive and uh, given to, you know, we see this here just uh, watermarked, almost made, kind of inaccessible. Um, so I have just one minute left, so I'll go ahead and do the last, last uh, section. So this is the Bishop uh, Richard Robert Wright White collection, which is just five reels, two of which are significant. And so I wanted to show, here's the finding aid, I was able to find the collection uh, this way. And this is, again, <coughs> the description. Going to the collection, I was found this amazing uh, receipt from purchasing Kodak film. Uh, Bishop Wright was a supporter of Roosevelt, which was very controversial at the time, uh, to support a Democrat. And he became bishop, and they sent him to South Africa, I think as a part to get a gift of away from the US and involved in political activities. And so in South Africa, he began making films. And he came back uh, because he was sick and showed his films, including in New Orleans. And one of those can close with some images from a film he shot uh, in South Africa. And this is the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, Wright was uh, also, I think, past president of Wilberforce University in Ohio. And so this is another outlet from the AMA Church. And just to think that this film made in South Africa of missionaries and towards the US. And uh, it's again quite seen. This is not an amateur film, this is a much bigger, larger project. Um, so I'll conclude with just a few small proposals, and I'll go through these quickly. Um, access, I think, isn't enough. I think, again, using these digital tools to connect can be really useful and really important, so archives can, can work with that. Uh, likewise, think belong beyond the local. Uh, the Taylor films are very well known in Memphis, but not outside, and so I think that limits their uh, general, uh, how well they're known more generally, and limits their kind of usefulness uh, as significant collection in that way. And then finally, I think the idea of building bridges. So the fact that uh, I knew the Jones films, but well, what else is there? I knew the Taylor films, there must be others. There's the Wright films. Uh, last night I saw another collection. So there are many African American ministers who are making films in this period. And that, I think, itself is really significant, not just for film archives, but also for scholars of religious history, scholars of African American life, and, and many others. So I think that's also very useful to consider. Um, so with that, I'll close, and thank you.
Hi, I'm Todd Weiner, the motion picture archivist at the UCLA Film and Television Archive. Jumping right in, uh, the UCLA Archive partnered with OutFest in 2005 to create the UCLA Legacy Project for the LGBT Living Image Preservation. And with the incredible support of founding depositor Jenny Olson and the many other filmmakers you see here, the Legacy Collection has grown to one of the largest publicly accessible collections of LGBT, LGBT, LGBTQ films in the world. There are almost 39,000 holdings as of November of 2017. Now, one of the main purposes of the Outfest Legacy Project is to make rare films available for research and deep study by academics. That goal has led to publications such as Hey, Look Me Over, the films of Pat Rocco by Whitney Strub, and others. The first public symposium on LGBT, films on LGBT film preservation, Out of the Closet, Into the Vaults, which was held at UCLA in 2006, as well as a periodic dedicated Outfest course at UCLA, which is currently being taught by former Legacy Project Manager Alice Royer. But in spite of these incredible collection growth and curatorial and academic accomplishments, the lack of pre-Stonewall representation of LGBTQ people of color was becoming more and more painfully evident. For example, several years, several years ago, the producers of Amazon's Transparent heard about the Legacy Project. They reached out to the archive looking for early footage of black and Latino trans people of color. And while we could point to a few interesting possibilities, most of the LGBT people of color in the collection were from the mid to late 80s or later and not the focal point of the film or footage. That is except for the title, Behind Every Good Man. Now some background on the discovery of this title brings us to our dear friend, colleague, and collaborator Stephen Parr at Oddball Films in San Francisco. As many of you know, Stephen's fantastically funky and eclectic programming has been an opportunity to discover and rediscover true cinematic rarities and ephemeral gems. In, two, in late 2011, Stephen Parr curated a program titled Life's a Drag, in which he screened Behind Every Good Man. The program caught the eye of my colleague Mark Quigley, who is the manager of the Archives Research and Study Center. Mark confirmed that the archive held this UCLA student film in the collection. Now, director Nikolai Ursin's artful and sensitively executed Behind Every Good Man was a perfect title to preserve for the legacy project. Its unassuming and highly restrained neorealist portrayal of an African-American transgender protagonist was like, unlike any of the stereotypical, hostile, and humiliating depictions of transgender or drag queen culture that was typically seen in the media at the time. Unlike these disparaging representations, Urson's unnamed trans woman is self-confident, romantically hopeful, and self-sufficient in the face of public judgment and potential abandonment. The archive immediately began searching to see if the elements and or prints of better condition existed for formal preservation efforts. Stephen Parr confirmed that he had no idea how to get in touch with a filmmaker, but he was happy to loan us his print that came from a private collection originally owned by a San Francisco nightclub owner and drag queen. Now, with some sleuthing and outreach to several sources, Mark Quigley and I were finally able to connect with multimedia artist and filmmaker Norman Yonemoto and his current partner, John Campbell. Norman was Nick's former partner until his death in 1990. Mark and I spent a lovely afternoon at Norman and John's house in Venice, where Nick and Norman had lived so many years ago. Now, Norman was clearly very ill, but both men were extremely enthusiastic to hear about the legacy project and our preservation efforts. So in addition to finding a great quality print of Behind Every Good Man, held by Norman and Parker John, they enthusiastically committed to depositing a collection of Norman's films. These included 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter footage of gay pride marches, elements for the 1969 Berkeley protest documentary, Second Campaign, and finally, the 1971 pioneering feature-length anti-Vietnam War gay porn, Brothers. Brothers was made under Yonemoto's known to plume Jason Sato. In fact, Norman and John were so excited about Brothers coming to the Legacy Project, they popped in a taped copy and screened it for Mark and I while we were trying to discuss the archive and its preservation programs. <laughs> that was a fun day at work. Uh, during our acquisition visits with Norman, it was quite clear that he was ill. He sadly passed away a short time after his collection came to UCLA. 
So with Stephen Parr and Norman Yonemoto's prints in hand, we confirmed that the print at UCLA was in the University Extension Collection, which had been purchased from film historian and preservation, preservationist David Shepard. So David confirmed he had received his print directly from director Nick, and they had been very close friends. Nick had edited David Shepard's Emmy-winning documentary, The Age of Ballyhood. And thanks to our initial re outreach to David, Norman, and John, we were finally getting a picture of this all but forgotten filmmaker. We learned that Nick had received his master's degree in cinema from UCLA, his undergraduate degree was in government from UC Berkeley, and much like Norman Yonemoto, Nick worked in porn as a cinematographer and editor, and sometimes as a pro producer and director utilizing the nom de plume Nick Elliott, discretion taking a prior priority since Nick's mother's brother was General Alexander Haig. So as an archival workflow for the title was finalized, the archive applied for and was awarded a preservation grant from the National Film Preservation Foundation. While the UCLA preservation staff worked on the title, I was in regular contact with Nick's family, especially his sister Maria and his Norwegian cousin Oyvind. The family shared many pictures, memories, and memorial tributes. Unfortunately, in all these years of outreach and collaboration with Nick's friends and family, there was no way to identify the trans woman of the short film. And we're just going to take a quick little peek. Go on. <clears throat> I'd like to live a respectable life, that's for sure. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to play the entire short, but I am very pleased to announce that the archive was has recently posted our restoration of this film on the Internet Archive in addition to our YouTube page. We hope that you will seek the film out and watch it in its entirety when you have a chance. So in, in addition to the two external UCLA media platforms and embedding the film on our website, the Archive is very pleased to partner early on with Marsha Gordon and Allison Field to have this film represented in their upcoming book, Race and non theatrical Film, to be published by Duke University Press. So by facilitating digital access before our preservation work was complete, media critic and, and uh, historian Noah Zika was able to dedicate an entire chapter of this special film in this book. So Behind Every Good Man is an excellent example of how academic and archival collaboration can promote the preservation and access to important portrayals of underrepresented communities. The UCLA Archive and our partners are very, very grateful to our many colleagues that locate and rediscover and program non-theatrical orphan films. And I just want to have a, a quick shout out to preservationist uh, Ross Lippman, who worked on this film when he was at UCLA and our uh, preservationist, Jeff Bickle, who's here in the front row, who worked with Bryce Lowe in our digital lab on the color correction of the digital version. So we hope you seek it out online. Thank you very much.
And speaking of Ross Lippman, I'm assuming you can pick him out of it in that picture. He does stand out. Um, before I start my official presentation, I do want to say, just uh, time to speak to what Todd was talking about. One of the things Allie and I did when we were putting together contributors for this collection is we reached out to a number of archivists and we said, do you have amazing non-theatrical films about race in your collection that you would really like to, to see the light of day and have someone write about because we will play scholarly archival matchmaker and we will try to find someone to write about these films. And you, you guys were wonderful. Mark and Todd responded and gave access to this and we, um, we, we cast it out for someone who seemed like they would be interested in this kind of project and I mean it's just worked out wonderfully and we're thrilled that it is online um, and will be streamable so that people can see the film in addition to reading the work. So um, I'm going to be talking about exploring student films at USC and uh, part of this project of um, kind of dedicating, uh, creating a space to think about race and not theatrical film, um, one of the reasons Allie and I wanted to do that was to um, intentionally kind of rediscover and activate uh, neglected films and also to think about what can evolve out of that process. So this is a scholarly collection, but we always thought about its interface with a larger public um, from the start of that work. So um, we decided to, uh, to work on some public programming in conjunction with even the planning of this collection before we had even fully uh, lined up all the chapters. So um, we've done a series of events at the Echo Park Film Center in Los Angeles, and you're looking at um, one of them from February 2017, which is an amazing place if you've never been. If you go to Los Angeles, I encourage you to check it out. It's a community um, screening space, and they do wonderful programming year-round, and they're also very open to guest curated um, series. So we decided to theme uh, these programs to race and space in Los Angeles. And so um, we reached out to Dino Everett at USC and um, to Todd and Mark at UCLA. And um, we said, look, what do you have uh, 16 millimeter film wise that you think we should consider? We knew a few titles that we wanted to program, including Felicia, which we had just published uh, about in Cinema Journal. Um, and uh, and so they provided us access to films and we made decisions about programming based on that. And we've shown films from the 1940s to the 1970s over the course of three um, totally beyond capacity events. We've had to turn away um, many dozens of people on some occasions for these events. And so um, it clearly indicated to us an interest, people wanting to think about this topic and have a space to have conversations about it because we always build in a kind of Q&A and short introductions. Um, so uh, in particular, one of uh, what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my few minutes today is to talk about some of the USC um, student films that dealt with race in Los Angeles. Um, uh, I don't probably need to tell this audience that mainstream uh, theatrical films of this period frequently either ignored the subject of race altogether or employed uh, very stereotypical representations of people of color. But when you start looking at student films, you get a whole other universe of representations. And what we have found um, is that these are consistently thoughtful, um, completely unconventional in terms of their imaginings of race and space um, and place. And um, so you begin to get a kind of collective, collaborative imagination of a city and its relationship to race through the eyes of these student filmmakers who were looking for subjects in their community that were accessible to them. So um, I'm going to just talk about uh, a couple of the films that we've programmed, these are the USC student films that, um, that Dino so generously provided access to. And um, let me just say, the archival community has been so generous with us in this process and um, has really opened up their resources. I mean, the archivists, of course, are the people who know their collections the best. And so we never hesitated to say, like, you tell us what you have that you think is really interesting and um, we can kind of cull from that. So these are the films that we um, have showed from uh, the USC student films at, over the course of these three events. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about um, what's revelatory and interesting about the process of looking into these films and trying to think about them in a kind of broader context or several broader contexts, because often these films are multiple things. They're student films. They're documentary, they're not theatrical films, or they're short fiction. Um, so they're not, they don't fit neatly into a single category. So 
One of the films that Dino, I think it was probably on your first list, is this film, um, Cotton Eye Joe, directed by John McDonald in 1970. And by the way, John is um, sitting next to Ross Lippman. Those of you who don't know, Ross Lippman is the one with the beard. Um, in the in the third row, second row. Um, anyhow, so John is just uh, to, beside him. So he's the director of this film. So he actually came to that screening. Um, this was an Academy Award shortlisted documentary about a man named Joe living in a makeshift encampment near Chavez Ravine, which was shot by John when he was a student at USC in 1970. This is not a didactic film, which many educational films from this time period are, but rather it's a very poetic, a uh, day in the life style documentary with some reenactment and it's a really unusual uh, cinematic document of a person, a place, and a time. Um, so uh, once we decided we were going to show this, um, of course I wanted to try to find and talk to the filmmaker and um, I found him and did a couple of interviews and I've passed along all the notes to Dino so that USC now has them and um, uh, he actually came to the Echo Park Film Center event but he first encountered Joe's encampment um, when he was location scouting in the hills of Elysian Park, got to know him over the course of around uh, two years, and as a senior in the fall of 1970, McDonald took the lead on a class film project, his 480 senior film project, and pitched the idea to make a day in the life film about Joe. <clears throat> um, right before going into production, Joe was arrested for vagrancy and he was sentenced to two months in jail, um, and actually John's faculty advisor and the future chair of the cinema department, uh, Mort Zarkov, went to, uh, with uh, John to court to try to get him um, released early from the Wayside Honor Rancho, uh, the county deten detention center, um, which was denied. So um, he stayed in, but as soon as he got out, they shot the film um, over a two week period. Uh, interviewing John about this project was so important because so often, these non-theatrical films, and especially student films, you have no production information about them at all. And we're in this time window where we have the opportunity where we can potentially find these filmmakers and create some kind of record of their history and a better understanding of the context of their uh, production, which is really essential, especially, I think, when dealing with this subject. Um, one of the things I learned is that uh, McDonald struck several prints of the film for himself and started his own distribution firm. Um, a kind of small distribution firm. Um, he mainly sold prints to libraries, but he did a study guide. Um, his father was teaching at USC at the time in the geography department, and he bought a mailing list, and he and his mom um, punch carded in addresses and mailed out flyers to libraries and schools, and that's the way they got the film out in the world. So um, we certainly never would have known that had we not found John. Um, one of the things that came out of this is uh, after interviewing John, um, I said, do you have the film materials still? He said, oh, I might. He looked, he found them, and they are now all at USC. I sent him over to Dino. So now there's additional film material, including he had forgotten that he had made a first film about Joe before he made the second film about Joe. And so he found it in the materials, and so that is now at USC as well. Um, and very briefly, uh, uh, the other film I want to talk about is this film, A Sense of Community, from 1976. This is a short documentary about a church-owned sewing operation staffed by undocumented Mexican workers in downtown Los Angeles, and it consists largely of two voiceover threads, one of a pastor who ran and promoted the positive impact of the program, and the other thread is workers who had a very different um, perspective. And Lizanne was a student at USC at the time he made the film, um, and because we were going to screen it, at the Echo Park Film Center, I tried to find him, and he now runs a car wash. And he um, was really surprised that I found him, but delighted. And so I got to interview him, and he talked about the fact um, that he really wanted to do, uh, he had heard about this kind of process of homework, where garments were produced at workers' home for sub-minimum wages, and um, basically wanted to, uh, to kind of explore this in his film, and had heard about this church where this was happening, and found a pastor who was really proud of the work he was doing, but in fact um, was locking his workers in this um, church basement and made all kinds of promises that were not realized. And so this was his attempt to make this activist student film. So these are two of the films that Allie and I talk about in the introduction to this collection of essays that will be coming out with Duke, and that um, we're working on a streaming component working out the details of exactly where it will be hosted, but so that as many of the films as possible that are talked about in this book um, will appear online so that people can 
see them. Um, but this project has also had this nice organic afterlife in terms of um, the circulation and exhibition of these films. The Echo Park Film Center, under Lisa Moore's direction, applied for a California Humanities Grant and got it. So in addition to the three programs on race and space in Los Angeles that Ali and I put together, um, they have gone on to do several others. They got funding for five additional events over the course of 2017 that Dino has been working on with them, and I'm, I'm hoping during the Q&A that Dino can say a few words about those. Um, and, and in general, I think it's galvanized an interest. We've had a number of people ask us if we would be willing to work with them on other kind of programming in different cities around this theme of race and space. Um, and maybe a place, because you could certainly do this in any community in which films were made. Um, and so that's all we have time for, but thank you very much, and now let's do Q&A. Hi, I'm Since the first uh, race in space in Los Angeles that we did all together, um, which was in 2014, I think yeah. you got up there, um, we, we sort of recreated, first thing we did was we recreated that program at the Mamie Clayton Library, and then again um, at basically uh, where Chavez Ravine was, uh, we did an outdoor screening. Um, and then when they got the grant, we sort of did a couple of uh, early ones that were focusing on African Americans in the community. And then we sort of reached out to different collaborators, like we did an Asian American one and collaborated with the, the people from Visual Communications. And, um, what's that? Oh, um, and then, uh, Laura Serna, who has a chapter in the book. Um, we, we did a Mexican-American uh, one, and so it's really sort of starting to branch out, so the, the concept that it could go to other cities and stuff is just really phenomenal. And just real brief about Cotton Eye Joe, um, it was really a wonderful find to find his earlier film, because Cotton Eye Joe is kind of a, an outside look at Joe, where you never you never hear Joe speak or anything, it's it's just watching him go through his day. Whereas the earlier film has only Joe's voice as sort of narrating it. So you, you get like these two sides of Joe's story. First him narrating his own story and then somebody looking at him and just portraying like this beautiful portrait. So together the two just make it even more fascinating. Questions, anyone? Let me just say, while these questions bubble to the surface, um, that if anybody wants to do a program like this and just wants some advice or ideas, please just email me or Allie. Um, we are happy to share uh, the wisdom we have about what we have done. Uh, I think this is a, uh, it's an infinitely replicable concept. Um, there's enough material streaming online, even if you don't have access to um, the ability to project prints in your particular community, um, and which I think is a really fun way to do it, but it's not the only way. Um, in conjunction, the question was about the access to the films under discussion. So we have asked all of the authors to work with uh, the archives that hold uh, the film materials that they are talking about to, um, 
to provide uh, access, and we have said that we would work with them on digitization if these materials are not yet digitized. So um, I'm not entirely sure where the, the website will reside yet. We're still working out the details. It might just be an internet archive and be a, be a distinct page there where people can go um, and, and have easy access to all of the film materials. But they, you know, that's been high on our list. It's really hard to have people engaged with scholarship about material that you can't see unless you go to an archive. I mean, that's just not a practical way, certainly for classroom use, um, but it's, uh, and, and you know, the fact that UCLA got this film online is this wonderful gift. A number of archives, Dino's been working to digitize materials. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's an incredibly important part of this process, and it strikes me, I, several of us have used this term hidden, and, um, and this really is partly a kind of an activist process about how do you target certain kinds of films and give them the ability to be out in the world and be seen again and to be talked about and to create a body of scholarship about them, but also to give access to people who are not in this particular community because these films have a value that's really potent. If you come, if you go to a screening event like this and if you have one and you show these films, I mean, these films are very moving. Um, they're full of surprises, and people want, people I think want to have conversations right now about race and class and um, geography and all these things. Yeah, Tim. And one of the great things that's happened from doing these screenings is you don't, you don't get the traditional like film geeks coming out, you just get people from the community and they have all this amazing information about the community and they have different sort of agendas so like when we did the um the last screening uh focused on the mexican americans um we we ran um chavez ravine and this woman came out who has this activist organization called buried which is all about the fact that this community got buried for the sake of putting up Dodger Stadium. And, and that was her only, her only reason for going to the screening was the fact that she saw Chavez Ravine mentioned. And so she came out. Um, and so I think it's, it's a really wonderful way to actually engage with the community. Because I always have felt that as archivists that we shouldn't just be these passive, um, you know, garters of the history. We should be active and involved in our communities that we serve. I have other things to say, but if there are questions, I'm happy to field questions. I'll say something about Behind Every Good Man. I mean, this is a really exciting thing for UCLA because most of our content is uh, under copyright. So in this particular case, we have a film here uh, where the estate gave us the blessing to put it online. We would really like to find out who the protagonist is. So by putting it on the internet archive, it's available for download in several different file sizes. So we are welcoming you to utilize this content. Uh, hopefully you'll credit us, but um, we would love to know who this protagonist is and find out some more information. So in the case of Transparent, they, would, they really wanted to use that, that footage but because we didn't know who the individual was, they couldn't legally. And so uh, we're very excited about these possibilities. Um, so, uh, Martin, you had mentioned the idea of going beyond the local. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting thing to reflect on. I mean, I don't know. How many people in this room are archivists? Okay, and how many of you are scholars that are not archivists but are interested? Okay, so more, more archivists than not, but um, I like the idea of using the idea of the local to organize uh, kind of these events, but then to broaden the reach out beyond that, and I think that's part of this process of doing this collection of essays and of trying to get the archival community behind it in terms of uh, bringing these films out into electronic distribution um, because the local is the national in so many ways, and I think uh, particularly at this time when we're thinking about uh, kind of race and, and class and politics, to get an understanding of how different communities were imagining this, and, and frankly, I think students are a kind of perfect 
place because the students are so tuned in, um, especially those who are looking for these projects. What we've found over and over again is that, I mean, they're looking for stories that seem important to them to tell. And so it's a great litmus test for the culture. And uh, I can imagine a project down the line taking these um, student films, for example, and really kind of doing a mapping project based on um, kind of ideas about race in the community and especially about things like gentrification, which come up over and over again. So I think, in other words, I think these kind of local acts of um, kind of uh, archival unearthing can have a much larger impact on film history and on cultural history over time. I think we're at the starting of this. So that's why I think it's so important for those of you who have the ability to bring this material out of your archives or to organize screening events to do so and to kind of draw attention to this and then to think about how to research it with them. I think it's also a case where the film archive offers more than we have in the paper archive. So I do most of my research looking at trade newspapers, local newspapers, and I was thinking, well, that's where I'm going to learn all these films that are going to extant, but are really interesting to kind of think about and research. And in the case of the three collections here, uh, there wasn't much in the paper record, and there wasn't much at all in magazines like Amateur Movie Makers. They were not discussing African American filmmakers. That was not on their agenda for all sorts of obvious reasons. And so it's really interesting to kind of see uh, something that you would assume if you were just looking at magazines to be kind of undone by looking at film. And I think that's also true for the student film collections. Uh, and the stuff that Walter has as well. So it gives us a more expansive sense of film culture than we just get by uh, reading other sources. Yes. You're talking about doing these community screenings and getting feedback from the audience. Do you have a formalized way of getting that feedback, like a, a flyer or something? Or? Oh, no. I mean, oh, not in terms of. Uh, you're talking about like written feedback post event. Right. Um, I will say written feedback. Um, Lisa tried at the last screening for Cal Humanities to get written feedback. No one wanted to fill it. Really? Good to know. Yeah. I mean, so what we've done at these events is we treat them kind of as as informal salons. So whoever is doing the introductions does fairly brief. Um, I would say at most five minute introductions sometimes more like two to three minute per film, and then um, really lively conversations afterwards. And then, of course, there's usually people who hang around after and give feedback. But yeah, for the California Humanities Grant, I know there was a response component, but we have not done a formal um, response, written response from the community. I do think that might be a little bit difficult. It's not impossible. I mean, you could certainly do it as you're going out the door. Okay. Oh, it's also, <laughs> also potential for uh, partnerships, and yeah, since uh, researchers have students, uh, it's a really nice partnership between students and archives. I found that students love doing research, more so than writing papers, and so it's really great, I think, for them to have that experience of doing working with collections that aren't known, and are not that much is known about it, and not any part of the discovery process. And then over time, you can build a lot of knowledge about these collections. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done there as well. Dr. Williams? Uh -huh. I, I just want to say thank you for this panel. I think the material is amazing and eye-opening and really inspiring. And uh, I'm, uh, not being as a scholar who's interested in, in helping to motivate more scholarship about it. But I'm wondering about the distinction you made between amateur films and home movies. And how important that is to take the project forward, or whether we might also invite archivists and scholars to, to work on home movies as well. I think there's, there's room for both. Um, the significance, at least in the three collections I was working with, is to characterize them as only home movies suggests that they're uh, a much smaller piece of the puzzle and the thinking of these as being publicly exhibited. And so that's a distinction that's important for these three collections, but obviously home movies also have lots of value and also give us insight uh, into all sorts of things that we otherwise wouldn't pick up on. So I think it's, what, what I'm most interested in though is the way that finding collections can transform how we think about how film has been used historically and how we understand its place in people's lives. Oh, so, absolutely. yeah. The, the distinction is important. I'm just wondering about moving forward would matter in terms of what? Well, whether, whether it just might produce more, more input from, from additional 
Oh, uh, definitely. I think that's, um, but obviously people in this room are very much involved in that, so that's, uh, I welcome that. It is three o'clock. Thank you very much for coming.